Christianity. Fascinating. These people actually believe the world is 12,000 years old. I swear to God. How do you get people to believe in an impossible process because you don't see one kind of animal changing into another today. You don't see life producing new information to go into our genes. You don't, don't see matter producing life by natural processes. You don't see any of that. Can you come up with something that you can predict? Do you have a creation model that predicts something that will happen in nature? Robert Ballard, who found the Titanic shipwreck in 1985, believes that there is evidence of a massive flood about 7,000 years ago, which is when the Bible situates Noah's story, and he thinks it's in the Black Sea region of, the, uh, of Turkey. Let's take a look. In 6,000 years? N not possible at all. It not, couldn't even begin to happen in 6,000 years. Yes. In order for us to know anything about anything, the universe would have to be a certain way. And it turns out it's the way the Bible says the universe is. If the universe were different from the way the Bible says it is, we couldn't know anything. Perhaps the most complex question in existence is the idea of existence itself. The people around us, the blue sky, the water we drink, the animals we own. Where does it all come from? For some, the idea is simple. About 4 billion years ago, the Earth was created when a massive explosion in space took place. After, organisms began to evolve, and we have the Earth we know today. However, some believe that it's more likely that the Earth was created with purpose, that it was designed by a higher power. Whether that be God or someone else, we don't know. According to the Bible, the Earth is about six to 10,000 years old. How can humans, intelligent humans, have this different of an ideology? What idea is more viable? Is the Earth 4 billion years old, 6,000 years old, or somewhere in the middle? Today, we're going to analyze this and debate faith versus science. So I'm Dave. Um, I'm a youth pastor here at Lighthouse Christian Church in Fond du Lac, and um, excited to be here. Doing my best to answer some of these questions, um, and so yeah, looking forward to it. So, well, first, could you just give us a simplified version of kind of explaining the origins of um, the Earth and um, humans? Mm -hmm. So, from you know, there's there's different views of it, and even from a, a creation view, there's there's mm -hmm. different views. Um, so the creation view would be God created the world. Uh, so obviously between, between Muslims and, and Christians, there would be different interpretations as we get, as we get further along. Mm -hmm. Who is that God that we're talking about? But for the sake of the conversation, um, that creation would be that, well, God, God created uh, God created the world, and so um, that's the big point amongst for Christians or, or a creation account that uh, in the beginning, mm -hmm. God, and um, you know that there's you know there's you have old Earth creationists and you have young Earth creationists, and right. so um, you know, even just probably during, during your time of research, you probably come, come across that, mm -hmm. that there's, there are people that are creationists that would say, well, we don't know exactly how old the world is, but we, we'll, we think that it's, you know, could be hundreds of thousands, millions of year, years old, whatever. And then there's young earth creationists that would say, well, uh, based on what we see in scripture, we take more of a literal look at that. And so, um, Jesus saw the Old Testament as God's word. Mm -hmm. John 17, 17 says that, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. So he's seen the Old Testament as something that is true, that actually did take place. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be part of my answer. Maybe not a full comprehensive answer to mm -hmm. what you're looking for, but um, to maybe get a better idea that's, that's kind of where, where I would say. 
Hello, my name is Dr. Joseph Fredrickson, and I'm the director of the Weiss Earth Science Museum in Menasha, Wisconsin. I know it's very complex, but if you could, if you could just give us a um, concise, um, just overview of how the Earth came to be in, from like a scientific standpoint. Okay, let's go over 4.6 billion years of evolution in a few minutes. Yeah, okay. you're right. It's, it is very complex. So uh, it really depends on what you're talking about as far as the Earth itself versus life on Earth, because those two things were happening and evolving at the same time, but they're two very different processes. One of them, the uh, Earth itself, is basically rocks. You know, how do rocks form? So the Earth fundamentally... It's kind of like a chicken's egg. We have this core on the inside, uh, but it's kind of like the yolk. We have outside of that is the mantle, and then we have the crust. That differentiation happened very early in the history of the Earth, basically when it formed from hot space dust uh, a little over four and a half billion years ago. Those different density elements differentiated. So the heavier ones went to the inside, lighter ones went to the outside, and that's really, really important. Because if we didn't have that solid metal core with a liquid core ro uh, revolving around it, we actually wouldn't have the electromagnetic field today that protects our atmosphere and protects our cells from uh, solar radiation. So without that, um, life would never have been, been able to actually begin on this planet. Um, with that, uh, we developed an atmosphere that was uh, able to sustain life because of two things, water and oxygen. Uh, we had plenty of water on Earth because we're in a good temperate zone where water doesn't completely freeze. It stays um, largely in its liquid form at the surface. And oxygen came about because of some of the first photosynthetic organisms, algae, um, that we start to actually see in the fossil record about 2.2 billion years ago. So they took all those gases from volcanoes and they turned them into breathable oxygen, which kind of opened the door for more complex life forms, namely animals, um, a little over 600 million years ago. And then since then, kind of evolution took its course and uh, more complex life ever since then. And, uh, you know, the Earth is on, a, on, its, uh, on its way to another 4 billion years of life until the sun swallows us up. Question <laughs> is, if you were trying to convince someone, um, if you had to point to one, one thing that is like, undoubtedly this is the best evidence this is you can't refute this what would what do you what in your opinion would that be as a paleontologist it's the fossil record i think the fossil record by far is uh it's it's the only direct evidence that we have of ancient life um, we can hypothesize by looking at two living animals that they may have had a a common ancestor but without for example a tyrannosaurus rex fossil we would never know that t-rex existed there's just no other way that we would know about it except for the fossils themselves. Mm -hmm. And the fossil record, as incomplete as, as it is, you know, less than 1% of all life on the planet fossilizes, is actually amazing in the sense of what we know from it. I mean, we have different layers of rock all over the world that show us what life was at different periods of time. And some of these, uh, some of these records show a lot of different animals that lived in different ecosystems and we've gotten to a point now for you know almost 150 years of collecting fossils and studying them in detail that we can kind of tell when we find one fossil which age it is and where it came from just by looking at it it's um it's so well documented at this point so you know for example we wouldn't expect to find uh, I think the classic example is a rabbit in the Precambrian sediments around the world because they just didn't exist. So you can look your entire life for that rabbit in the Precambrian, and honestly, you'll probably never find it. There is no amount of evidence that we will be able to find, I think, that will convince everybody that, hey, evolution's true. And, you know, we're, why would we want to even do that? I don't, you know, there's got to be a place in there for you to put in your own beliefs or stories or culture. That's fine. You know, that's human nature. We're, all, we're always going to have um, a gap that we're going to fill in our knowledge. So I think as far as there will never be enough evidence to satisfy people who don't want to accept evolution. That's just how it's going to be. But we can still collect more and we will collect more. Mm -hmm. The opposite is not true, though. You could, for example, if we found human bones next to trilobites, 
that were, it went extinct 250 million years ago, all buried together in flood sediments. You find that, that's going to be really hard to explain otherwise. If we had one piece of evidence that could destroy evolution, like a misplaced fossil that was not reworked, that was authentic, that would lead us to have to question, re-question uh, how we've put together our understanding of the world. So I think what we're really up against here, and this is kind of the faith versus science aspect, is an insurmountable amount of uh, evidence needed for science versus one piece of evidence for bringing it all down. And I think the fact that we haven't found that yet, after how long, probably means we're never going to find something like that. But if we do, by nature as scientists, we have to change our thinking. So I'm always on the lookout for it, and I would love to find that trial bite with a person because then I'll be famous, and I'll make <laughs> lots of money, and I'll be in a, I'll have a nature paper. But uh, unfortunately, it's just, yeah, everywhere I've looked, I haven't seen it yet. What do you think is the best evidence? If you had to point to one specific thing and say, like, well, you can't explain this without scripture. Mm-hmm. Um. I mean, I think that there's three big arguments that you don't really need scripture at all Mm -hmm. to just, when it comes to creation, and and really when we're talking about creation, we're also answering the question of does God exist? Um, And so the first one would be the cosmological argument that if, if the universe had um, a beginning, a beginning, then there must be a beginner. Mm-hmm. Um, William Lane Craig says, um, he has a, a book called the Kalam cosmological argument. It goes like this, whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore the universe has a cause points to something or someone outside the universe that brought the universe into existence. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's the Christian God, uh, but it's pointing to a, a God. So if the universe had, or so if, if the universe had a beginning, there must be a beginner. It leaves us with evidence of either two possibilities. One is that uh, no one created something out of nothing. That's the typically the atheist worldview. Mm-hmm. Or someone created something out of nothing, more theistic worldview. Mm-hmm. So the question becomes, which one is more reasonable? If someone created the world out of nothing, that's a miracle. and It shows it's a miracle. Uh, John 1 1 would say that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now this this is just me knowing knowing scripture, but you could use this argument without scripture, mm-hmm. and that Jesus is the word, and that he created everything there is, nothing exists that he didn't make. Um, but even without that scripture, you can still make the point. So if, but here's, here's the interesting thing, that if nothing created nothing, you have a miracle with no miracle worker. So, that in and of itself is absurd. Mm -hmm. Which one is more reasonable that someone created something or, or no one, nothing created something out of nothing. So that's the cosmological argument. The second one is, I think probably a better one, um, would be the teleological argument or the design argument. Mm -hmm. This one would say similar to if there if there was a beginning, there have to be a beginner. This one is a little bit more specific in that if there, if you see design, there must be a designer. So if you see, it's kind of the fine tuning of the universe. Mm-hmm. So um, if the universe is off by just a tiny, tiny bit, everything kind of goes to shreds. The human eye, for example, Human eye has 40,000 different nerve endings focusing on more than 100,000 different times per day. It has over 137 million light sensitive cells. Charles Darwin said to suppose that the eye 
could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. It's essentially like trying to say that this book, who is pretty, actually pretty sweet, you like the NBA. You like the NBA. Yeah. <laughs> With all these colors and, and pictures and, and writings and, and texts and everything written out here, that this book could write itself, that something could come from nothing, that even though there's all this design, we're saying, no, there's, there's, if there's, I should say, if you see design, there must be a designer, that this, these colors happen by chance, the ink, the black ink happen by chance. Coherent sentences happen by chance, you know, punctuation, commas, all that happened by chance. We would say, no, we look at this, we say there was there was a writer, there was there was design to this book. And so that's that's the teleological design argument in a nutshell. The last one would be uh, a little bit more philosophical, but that's the that's the moral argument. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, that um, that there's, you know, that the, the moral argument would say, if there's one thing morally wrong in the world that we probably all agree on, uh, it's that it's probably not okay to torture babies for fun. That would just be one thing that we'd say, yeah, that's probably inherently wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would say, you know, there, well, there must be a God then. Well, why? Because if there's no standard of rightness or an objective standard of good, then who's to say that, that torturing people for fun is wrong? It's just my morality versus your morality. It's very subjective at that point. Um, so to, uh, for torturing people, abuse, trafficking, if there's no standard of good, then these are just all a matter of opinion. Um, that we would, if we if we were lost in the woods, if we had no compass, um, or that compass always pointed to ourselves, that's not a good compass. We need something that's true north. We need something that is going to tell us where to go and, and who that is. And so, um, this would point to there must be an objective moral standard beyond just what I think or what I think is good. Because in that case, then what's the difference between Mother Teresa? Uh, what's the difference between her and, say, Hitler? Hitler would say, no, I, I wanted to, you know, kill Jews. This makes me feel good. Um, I like it. Uh, what's the difference? Well, that's, that's his view of morality. In his view, he would say, they're not people. Um, he would say, they're, they're, it's okay for me to kill these people because they're not really human. And so you get into the morality argument of how do we know what is good? How do we know what's true? And this is going back to my, my viewpoint as a, as a Christian, as a believer, is that Roman, Romans 1 talks about how we are without excuse because God has put a moral law into our hearts, that there's a consciousness. It's when somebody's at school and it's a bully that's beating up a kid and stealing his lunch money, uh, there's something in us that wants to go in and stop that. Why? Because there is a moral law that God has put on our hearts to, to instinctively know this is wrong. Um, so those are just, those are some of the, the things that would point to good arguments, I would say, it would be a cosmological argument, teleological argument, the design argument, and then the more philosophical would be the moral argument. Chances are we will never find definitive evidence for either side, but that shouldn't stop us from trying to find it. In the end, the never-ending quest to find the answer of humanity will forever be one that will be unsolved, but never forgotten.